Starmer should realise he's never going to be able to outflag the Tories. They're always going to have more Union Jacks than he's got. That's their brand, mm -hmm. you know. So he's wasting his time trying to, you know, cram Union Jacks in behind him when he's when he's talking to people. Instead, Until like you just see his eyes, yeah, like, right, yeah, they fill yeah, up yeah, the that's frame. Right, yeah, he's got a suit, a Union Jack like Pete Townsend, <laughs> Union Jack suit. It's you know, it it's ridiculous. What does it mean to love the place that you're from? If you listen to the Daily Mail, it would mean pledging allegiance to the flag, the king, the army, and, I don't know, Anton Deck's Saturday night takeaway every day. But maybe there is the possibility of something different, a progressive patriotism, in fact, which defines itself by inclusivity, multiculturalism, and class struggle. To discuss whether or not patriotism is ever something that can be reclaimed for the left, or whether that's just a Big old fantasy, I'm joined by Billy Bragg, musician and author and all-round legend. I had hoped we'd be having this conversation looking forward to England in the final, but it wasn't... Yeah, today. you obviously don't understand Englishness enough. <laughs> well, look, Ash, I, I understand, mean, you know, a, understand Englishness... I could have told you we wouldn't be talking about I that. understood Englishness enough to know that we would find a way to go out on penalties, even when there wasn't yeah. a shootout. Yeah, blame Harry. Uh, Poor old fellow, I will fully feel sorry for him. I think, I think it was the nerves that got him, but... We talked about progressive patriotism ages ago for Owen Jones's show, and I thought it was such a good conversation, but a kind of um, a, a curtailed conversation, and I wanted to have the more expansive version of it. Yeah. So for you, is progressive patriotism an idea you came up with just so you can enjoy football more? Um, well, there is an element of that in it. To, it. It was an idea I came up with so that I could even enjoy being uh, expressing my English identity without feeling... I'm offending anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, there's got to be space. And not only that, also because the, you know, the start of the century, the British National Party kind of cornered the market in white working class identity. And mm -hmm. I thought that was wrong because I didn't think everybody was that way minded. Obviously, when Brexit came along, that expanded, mm -hmm. that whole idea expanded, that nationalist idea, and the Conservatives became a kind of British nationalist party. Um, but, I, you know, I've always felt that identity is personal construct. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. It's only when someone tries to tell you different based on the color of your skin or your religion or the way you dress or whatever that it becomes a problem. Do you, do you think that there's a specific need to articulate a white working class identity as opposed to a working class identity which isn't explicitly racialized or implicitly racialized? I think it would be good to uh, be able to broaden the idea of the working class to include everybody who fits into that mm. designation. Because I think when people talk about the working class, they're generally talking about the white working class. They, they see or in as media, they say white working yeah, class yeah, as, yeah. as one yeah, concept. Uh, which I, which, and I don't think they are one concept. You know, the rural working class are different from the urban working class. The industrial working class are different from the white collar working class. Mm. You know, I had a, my father had an industrial uh, white working class background because he worked in the ancillary uh, companies around Fords at Dagenham. Mm. So he was like, you know, he wore overalls at work, although he had a tie on, and he saw photographs of him at work. He's always got a tie on. Like <laughs> it's really strange. He was a warehouseman. Whereas I had a, a white collar working class. I was a bank messenger, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, I was, when I left school. So these were two completely different experiences. So uh, to try and lump everybody together and to um, make the white working class experience a, a, a single thing, it would be like trying to, you know, it's white working working class is a bit like POC, mm. you know, it, it involves a, a lot of things. It's shorthand for a lot of things. So helping to focus on aspects of that and finding within that something that isn't a, a traditional reactionary mm. idea of what working class, because there are plenty of reactionary racist people in the working class. I mean, I was amazed how reactionary the miners were when we, and during the miners' strike, we went into South Wales to do gigs there. You know, they were sexist, they were homophobic, they were racist at the start of the strike. Was you know. the process of having to work together with different kinds of people during the miners' strike, though, something that changed it, or did it kind of remain intact? I think, that, well, it certainly changed it on the surface. You know, I think they recognised that, you know, that there were other people out there who were marginalised like them, or other people out there who were victims like them, some within their class, some without it. Mm. Um, and that, that really helped broaden it. And it wasn't quite as um, Love Actually as the movie Pride makes out. Mm. But it was, it did happen. That process definitely happened. I think we all of us realised that it was bigger than just the miners. You mm. know, that it was, it was, obviously it was a class struggle. Mm. But, the, you know, we'd seen from, um, you know, other strikes earlier in the 70s, you know, uh, um, the 
Grunwick strikes and places mm. like that. You know, the, it was beyond just uh, white working class people. Do you people. want to explain what the Grunwick strike yeah, is for our viewers who might not They know. were uh, Asian women who worked uh, for a, I think it was a photography company. Yeah, was yeah, it? yeah, yeah. yeah. And they uh, they were involved in the most hardcore picket line, cops come down, bash everybody over the head kind of strike in 73, 74, I think mm -hmm. this is while I was at school. Um, and, you know, to, to suggest it was all, you know, a horny-handed sons of toil, mm -hmm. the, the working class, or, or working class activism even. Uh, you, you have to look past, you know, when you find the picket lines, mostly people wearing saris, mm -hmm. you have to really rethink your idea of who is the working class. And I don't think that's changed. I think that's exactly the same. Because I find it, I find the um, the formulation of white working class really interesting. Because you never say the black working class, you never say the South Asian working class, or, no. or whatever else it is. This is the only group where working class has to get articulated as though it's a kind of ethnic minority. And I was talking to my partner about it, who is both white and working class, or comes from a working class background, and he was like, "I would never describe myself as white working class. I would never put race in there." No. But isn't that because we're we're centered in it? Those of us who are white working class, mm. we're the we're the norm, we're the the ordinary. You know, I think when people use the white working class term, they're really trying to evoke someone a bit like Alf Garnet. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. they're trying to say that you know these people are always going to be uh, anti-immigrant. These people are always going to be uh, traditionally patriotic. That's not been my experience. You know, it's it's much more interesting than that. It's not much more diverse than white working class than that. You know, even when I was at school, you know, we there although we weren't explicitly thinking of ourselves as being anti-racist, the cultures that we were diving into, you know, mm -hmm. particularly with uh, uh, Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. Afro Caribbean culture and music terms, that broke down all those barriers for us. You know, so was it the era of like Scar and Two Tone and encountering that. that? It was before that. Yeah, I mean, Two Tone and uh, and that kind of big focus on Scar. Um, that really came in the late seventies, but in the early to mid seventies, while there was this glam thing going on, there was also a kind of a uh, um, a reggae thing, a pop reggae thing going mm -hmm. on. You know, so I'm in a school disco. I must be thirteen, fourteen years old. It's lunchtime, and all my mates we're dancing, we're singing at the top of our voices, "Young, Gifted, and Black." <laughs> I mean, it's mad, isn't it? <laughs> when I think back about it now, we're like all singing it and we're all dancing. It's like, yeah. Something's going on here. Something very interesting is going on here. You know, obviously it was, it must have been different for our South Asian, mm. uh, you know, school friends who, who, you know, connected with us over playing football in the playground. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that was, that worked for them. Obviously they, they came from a completely different cultural background, but our uh, Afro-Caribbean friends, everybody worked at the car factory. Everybody's dad worked at the car factory, whatever your ethnicity was around where I, where I came from. So that kind of brought us together as well. So, yeah, I think music helped to to crack into the white working class idea. So is uh, so I read your book, The Progressive Patriot, and one of the things that was really striking to me about it is that so much of it is about music. So is yeah. that how you developed this idea of a different kind of patriotism? Yeah, we, those of us who can remember the 20th century, and that's how old I am, <laughs> music was our own, our only social media we, mm. medium. We didn't think about it like that at that time, but it, it you know, it said who you were. The, the records you listened to kind of defined you as a person, sort of told you how to dress, mm -hmm. told you who to hang out with, who not to hang out with. So music had to kind of convey everything that, we, that young people thought about. You know, when I was 19 and I wanted to uh, express my views about the world, the only avenue open to me was to learn to play guitar, write songs and do gigs. There was no other opportunity for someone from my background to have their voice heard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you weren't good at football and you didn't box at our school, you play, learn to play guitar, and that was your way out of not working in the car factory, which is what I was. Because they used to take us to the car factory every year <laughs> to show us. Well, I don't know where the girls went, but the careers officer used to take us to the car factory. And when I said I didn't want to work for Fords, the careers officer literally said to me, "Oh, well, you have three choices then: brag the army, the navy, or the air force." And he gave me the gave me the leaflets to join. That was that was what I was educated to do. Now, I don't God. feel badly about that. It's one of those things, you know. I, it was fortunate, really, because. The car factory made Barking and Dagenham quite an affluent area. Yeah. I mean, now, it, I go back there now and it breaks my heart because, you know, there's there's a tenth of people working for Fords at work. When I left school, there were 40,000 people working at Fords and then probably that um, similar amount working for the ancillary companies like my dad did, you know, and making all little bits and working for them. Now, the, the, the whole heart of the place has kind of disappeared in that sense, which is, which is heartbreaking. I mean, people still, my brother 
still lives. So my, my nephew lives in the house we grew up in when my mum passed away. Mm. My brother inherited the house and he lives there. And I go back there and, you know, I love the place, but it doesn't have that vibrancy that it had when people were working for the car factory. I mean, Barking and Dagenham was one of the few, if not the only London borough, which voted leave in 2016. How did that make you feel at the time? Well, I'd already had to get over the fact that I elected 12 BNP councillors mm. in 2006. That was really, you know, really struck me. I mean, fortunately, they couldn't find more people to stand because I think they, everyone they stood won their seat. If they'd have stood a complete slate, they'd have probably taken the council. I mean, that would have been mm. a nightmare, absolute nightmare. So, yeah, I, I already had to um, deal with people calling my hometown the, the racist capital of Britain. I mean, it's not, Barking and Dagenham is no more racist than your hometown. It's just mm. that those bastards were knocking on doors, setting neighbour against one another, you know. So I'm not surprised it was the, you know, the most uh, leave voting places. An odd, an odd thing about Barking, the, the 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 old London borough of Barking before it became Barking and Dagenham, there the Barking Council, their motto was in English, it's Latin, it's uh, basically uh, we are what we are. Mm-hmm. You know, takes or leaves. You don't like us, piss off. Basically, that was the that was the dumb <laughs> it motto. It was like yeah. the mill wall of boroughs. It's like you know, <laughs> a bit, a little bit. It's always been a little bit like that. But by the same token, it was a you know, it was a great place to grow up because because the unions were so strong. Mm. The you know, education, healthcare, all the all the important aspects of uh, 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 you know, social fabric were. Funded mm. and focused, you know. Barking's been Labour since it was carved out of Essex as, mm. a, as a, you know, a district council. And my dad was a kid, so it, you know, it always had that. But that's that's kind of got lost now, and it's, you know, it's not not as it was. That was one of the things that was really striking um, for me. So I did some vox pops in Barking and Dagenham in 2016, immediately following the referendum, because I wanted to understand this London borough, because I grew up in London, I studied in London, I've stayed in London, and you will have to drag my cold, dead body out of London because I love this place. And so I really wanted to understand, like, what is this corner of London saying? And one of the things that was really apparent to me is that people just did not feel looked after. And all of that blame was being channeled towards immigrants and asylum seekers specifically. But there was a feeling of, we're vulnerable and we've just been left abandoned to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there was huge demographic change in Barking and Dagenham in uh, in the last couple of censuses. It went from like ninety six percent white to something like seventy percent mm. white. But this really, of all the London boroughs that are shocked by demographic change, you'd think Barking and Dagenham would be the least because in the nineteen twenties they built this huge, the biggest housing estate in Europe at Beckentree Heath. That's in it's in Dagenham, it's in Barking, it's in Ilford. My mum's family, who were uh, my uh, Great grandfather was an Italian immigrant. They lived in Cable Street. They lived in a, a tenement in Cable Street in, in mm. um, uh, Peabody Buildings. And my grandfather uh, got a job as a spot welder at Fords, and then mm. and that allowed him to move into Beckenshaw Heath and they had this lovely uh, timbered house on a little what they referred to as a banjo, which is a bit like a a, a cul de sac. Had an indoor toilet. Had a, you know didn't have to share the the facilities with anybody. I mean it was just incredible. And they you know the the borough. Uh, tripled in size in its population mm. in the years before the Second World War. So you think they would have some experience of incomes because then, you know, one of the problems that, you know, my, my mother's family were Catholics because they were Italian mm. Catholics. So that, they were kind of outsiders in that sense. But they didn't build any churches as well. That was a bit of a, mm. that all came a bit of a problem. Then schools as well because they needed a Catholic school. You know, there was, it, it wasn't just all, you know, uh, lovely stuff, you know, darling buds are made. There was some friction then with the people who'd always been there and the new people who came in. But, uh, you know, in the uh, 90s, the last house that was still as it was when they first built them, some little old lady died and they went in her house and it was, she said she still had the original gas stuff and the original lights and the, mm. she just never changed it. And I was, uh, got in touch, a group got in touch with me who wanted to preserve that and were interested if I was interested in helping them out, maybe mm. I could pay the rent on it or something like that, which I was up for. Mm. And and I got, you know, we spoke to the council, but they weren't interested. And I thought it was a miss because they could have used that to build a narrative of change, to build a narrative of people coming and people going, a narrative. Mm. Because what the, the thing about the car factory was, it allowed people to work on the line for a long time or for, for a reasonable amount of time and then move somewhere leafy mm. that begins with ch like Chingford or Chigwell or yeah. Chabwell Leaf. Or there was, it was a process. You know, when I 
when I was very young, the people who lived over the road from us in Barking were all immigrants from Ireland. There were three families, Murphy's, mm -hmm. O'Brien's, and the Browns. And I mean, their, their parents' accents were impenetrable. They were <laughs> impenetrable. Mr. O'Brien used to say stuff to me, and I'd have to look at what, you know, Mossy or one of the other kids. So they'd kind of give me the meaning. Of what he, not quite, but give me the meaning of what he was <laughs> on about. Then they were replaced by people from the Caribbean. Uh, they were then replaced, replaced from people from the Indian subcontinent. And this was part of a process that allowed people to, to move on up from a two up, two down, you know, Victorian houses where we live to nicer places out there. And that process has ended. And so that, I think people in Barking and Dagnum, the, the people who are able to move have moved on. And then what's happened is because of the housing stock, it's the, it's the actual cheapest housing in the whole Greater London. Mm. So obviously, even people from, Brit from Britain, if they want to come and live in London, they're going to come mm. and move to, to Barking and Dagenham. So there's a, quite a lot of churn. I mean, so that, that, that's one way of describing that process, which is you, you're able to get a job where the wages are fairly decent, really cost decent. of living isn't too yeah. bad, you know, it's unionised work, yeah. right? And that makes a massive difference. People move to the Chesants and the Chingfords and Not, the... the yeah. I don't know about Chesant. I think mean, Chesant might be a bit out of the way, bit, but I don't know. You've got, it's got to be up the A12 or it's the A13. Like, or A13. Yeah. It's, it's like that process. But yeah, then yeah. There's, the, there's the flip side to it, which, which is white flight. Yeah. So if you take a place like Thurrock or if you take a place like Broxbourne, that white flight ring around London in the early 2000s, that was the BNP's focus, yeah, yeah. In, in addition to Barking and Dagenham. And even now, like sometimes when I go around there, I get that feeling of it's like, oh, you moved here to get away from people like yeah, me. Yeah, I yeah. am, oh, sorry. Like the chill. Yeah, it's yeah. real. Um, how how do you sort of square that? Because there's the story of social mobility and there's the story of, of, yeah. of white flight, of escaping, of aversion. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way I see it, I mean, you know, the, the people of colour were moving out as well. You know, mm. people people move for different reasons. More, that, more like Ilford. Yeah. Ilford was where the, like, you became a well-to-do South Asian, you go to Ilford. Yeah, but they were people who had come from Cable Street. They are people who, you know, mm. so my, our family, you know, left Cable Street. Well, Cable Street um, in the in the 30s, was a big uh, ethnic area. You know, mm. that's where the, the um, British Union of Fascists used to mm. focus their, their meetings. My, my auntie, my mum's older sister, saw Oswald Mosley speaking outside. You know the Ritzy? Yeah, that yeah, gig? yeah. Yeah, she saw him when it was a cinema. She saw Mosley speaking outside there, you know, and they used to say to my mum and her sisters, if you stay out late, the black shirts will get you because they mm. were an immigrant family, you know. So those people kind of, flew, mm. if you like, from, from Cable Street. Mm -hmm. and, then, and another group of immigrants came in to get that, take that cheaper housing. What's happened, that process has moved out to the, to the more outer mm -hmm. boroughs, places like Barking, where there's, you know, there's not a huge amount of gentrification mm. going on there, you know. Despite attempts by the council to build new stuff down on the, by the river, it's kind of stalling a bit because it's not, they need somewhere that employs people again. You mm. know, they were talking about building a super prison on one of the old... Uh, a full part of the Ford plant site and those kind of things. They're looking at that sort of thing now, which is, I'm not sure that's the sort of job have you, that you have, have. you have. you Did you hear about the prison craze in the 1980s in the States? Have you ever heard about this? No, no. So basically, um, one of the sort of like uh, Ronald Reagan uh, policies was, was to look at these like rust belt towns, which had been built around an industry. The industry yeah. is gone. And so they made these different towns bid to have a prison. And there was this one town which, as part of their bid, did like a, a gimmick rap song called wow. Is We Is or Is We Isn't Gonna Get Ourselves a Prison. Oh and my so it's, God. you know, it's the <laughs> local mayor and the sheriff. And there's something like really hideous about that, which is this predominantly white town, entirely white police force yeah. and oh, political yeah, yeah, class, yeah. using rap to be like, We'll take your incarcerated black people yeah. from Detroit and yeah. from Chicago. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. We'll, we'll take them. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a similar kind of story to exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. Is, yeah that's, what I, that's what I thought about when they were talking about building the super prison. Because paradoxically, where I live in uh, Dorset on Portland, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, there used to be three prisons on Portland. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a floating prison in Weymouth Harbour. There's the old uh, Vern prison. And mm -hmm. then there's the Young Offenders, Portland YOI which was built by Napoleonic prisoners of war. So imagine what that's like. Eesh. And it's predominantly black kids from London who are in there. It's and it's London just... kids. And it's like beyond, you know, you, the trains don't go there. You can get a train to Weymouth, but then you have to get this terrible bus up onto Portland, up onto the windy, up onto the... And then you look out from the windows of it and you're just looking out over the ocean. It's an horrible place. An it's like psychological place. torture. It is, it is. And particularly 
for families who are trying to visit from London. You often see them on the trains going, you know, coming down to mm. Weymouth. I mean, I want to I want to get back to this like traditional traditional versus patriotic. Yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, traditional patriotism versus progressive patriotism. For you, what's the difference between those? Things? Well, a traditional patriot um, he, uh, takes pride in um, immutable ideas. Mm-hmm. So uh, the monarchy, mm-hmm. the army, symbols like the flag, um, a particular idea of what constitutes Britain or England. Mm-hmm. Whereas a, uh, and also they're they're uh, predominantly interested in assimilation. They believe in assimilation. Mm-hmm. If you want to be part of this, then you've got to be like us. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the cricket test, basically. That will be a, what you would call traditional patriot. Someone tried to cricket test me when uh, it was Morocco versus Spain in the football, and I was like, obviously, come on, Morocco. And they were like, oh, what side of the cricket test do you fall down? And I was like, I'm neither Moroccan yeah. nor Spanish, and this is football. Yeah, it's football. Yeah, of course you want to see an underdog take. You know, yeah, I was going to be like, there's nothing them- more. English than wanting the, the um, underdog yeah, to yeah. win in the yeah. World Cup. Yeah, and as a West Ham fan, I relate to that. You know, it's <laughs> kind of like a hundred percent underdog thing. So, to contrast that with what you might call patriotic, uh, a, uh, a progressive patriot, a progressive patriot believes in values, mm-hmm. in the values that a country uh, is supposed to um, adhere to. So, in in the case of Britain, those values are according to what they they uh, ask immigrants to learn, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and they're in their test, their fair play, rule of law, so accountability. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think the progressive patriot was also uh, takes pride in behavior. When, mm-hmm. the, when the country does something positive, they, they're, they're proud of that. When it does something negative, they speak out. Mm-hmm. They, want, they, they get angry about things because they love the country. They get angry when it doesn't live up to those values. Mm-hmm. And then they're, they're interested in diversity. To, to them, diversity is a plus. It's something that makes the country great. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so those those two completely different ideas of of what you take pride in are still about being proud about this space mm-hmm. that we call England, rather than the idea of England. I think the progressive patriot is talking about space, not race. So in- Englishness, a hard thing to define, an intangible thing perhaps, mm-hmm. would be everything that happens within that space that we call England and, and the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the cities, the countryside, all of it is together part of Englishness. Quiz time. What is the UK national anthem? The UK's national anthem is God Save the Queen. Right. Oh, God Save the King now. Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. God Save the King. I know. Right. God Save the That's going to take me a while. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, you know what? I still call him Prince Charles because <laughs> my brain... Do it again. Right. Sorry, that's right. stupid. Quiz time. What's the, what's the UK national anthem? God Save the King. And what is the French national anthem? La Marseille. And where does that come from? From the revolution. It comes from the revolution, right? So it is um, citizens to arms. It is about taking down the uh, conspirator kings. It's about fighting off invading foreign elites. It's about French people and how the French people were born in a revolutionary moment. What the fuck is our song about? Okay. Who chopped the king's head off first? Yeah, we did it. Exactly. And then we forgot about it. No, we We're didn't. We're ashamed we of didn't. it. What happened is because the the revolutionaries believed in accountability, they sought to hold the king to account. That's why he got his head chopped off. They put him on trial. No one had ever put a king on trial I before know, the first I, time. And okay? I'm proud of the exactly, fact we tried exactly, the king. Exactly. But they weren't planning for a republic. They were kind of left in this situation like, well, what the fuck are we going to do now? And that's why it kind of never really worked. They hadn't gone into it with a plan. So unfortunately... The tide came back in again. But that was the English. That's who we are. We're that people that were, got so wound up about accountability that we did Magna Carta. We did a reformation. We chopped our king's head off over, over, you know, is anybody above the law? Don't tell me that's not a revolutionary idea. And that's still the basis of our, our, our settlement. But the thing that I'd say is that, like, I think that we had a quite effective counter-revolution, which absorbs some of these ideas. Of course. But then all, culturally, has said, well, like top down, this is what the country is. Your national anthem is God Save the King, whereas France has 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 the Marseillaise. And so I'm not saying that we throw away the idea of loving the place where you are, right? The the culture that you feel an affinity to. I love this culture and I love this place. But you know, the national anthem for me is the problem of of British patriotism. It's that you're not actually talking about an allegiance to people. You're talking about allegiance to the elites. I feel very deeply English. I don't think any other culture could produce this personality. 
um when it comes to the cultures that this country has 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 produced in terms of music i mean my favorite genres of music are drill and grime and afrobeats and house music all forms of music which have come from britain's encounters with other cultures um i studied english lit at university because i love it and i love shakespeare and i love virginia wolf and all of this stuff but this love for culture and place i mean i literally have a pg tattooed on my ribs for palmer's green because oh, how lovely like, no, not pg tips not pg tips oh, there's okay. parental guidance pinot grigio and <laughs> Palmer's Green. Pinot Grigio, I never um, thought of that one. <laughs> and uh, my best friend has it on, on his arm as well. Yeah. Right, so, so there is a love for place. There is a love for place. But it is not recognised as uh, patriotism. And in fact, I'm presented as someone who is anti-English, anti-white, anti-British, blah, 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 because of that process of criticising what I believe to be vested interests, elitist interests. So the thing I put to you is that you can love this country, and I do love this country, but if it's not recognised as patriotism, what's the point of calling it patriotism? Because it allows us to take back some territory from the right, from the fascists, from the racists. Who, if we don't dis try to define an inclusive sense of English identity, mm -hmm. uh, then they, they will define who does and who doesn't belong. And they don't have that right to do that. Mm -hmm. We have to con constantly say we belong. Mm -hmm. We're part of this because what you're talking about is belonging rather than patriotism. You know what I mean? And that's a really important thing. If you don't have that, if you don't feel you belong, mm -hmm. then you, you, how can you love a country? If you, you know, how can you love? How can you have that love of place? That's absolutely uh, essential to being angry when things don't go the way you think they should. So, how much of this is rooted in fantasy? Because I'm thinking about some of what what I consider to be the great political albums of recent years. One being um, Dave's album "We're All Alone in This Together," yep. and a theme throughout this is like a sense of isolation and apartness and um being made to feel like you don't belong yeah. and that's what i think he so brilliantly articulates and i think the thing he's refusing to do is participate in the fantasy yeah and that's what he's saying is the condition of black britishness yeah. this is refusing to to idealize it like do you think that the work of progressive patriotism there is a degree of idealizing there is a degree of fantasy well, you've got to put out an idea. You've got to be able to articulate what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the response to Dave's position is how do we make the idea of Englishness something that he feels he can be part of? Because I, when I was writing The Progressive Patriot, I was mm -hmm. working with a, 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 a black guy who was selling our T-shirts. It was a T-shirt guy. And every night I was rapping from the stage. I had the album England Off English out. And mm -hmm. I was talking about all these things on the stage in an anti-BMP way. And we were talking, you know, we'd be in a bar after the show and he'd be laughing about what I was saying. And he, although he was born in London and he, you know, he obviously was English as, as I am, really, he didn't feel English. He, he felt he was a Londoner and a citizen of the European Union because when he was at school, people told him he wasn't English. Mm. And that gap is down to those of us who are seen as being English. We've, we have a responsibility to try and f fill that gap so that people who aren't seen as being English because of their ethnicity or because of their religion or whatever do feel part of that thing, a greater thing, mm -hmm. that we don't allow the traditional patriots, patriots to define what it is that is. Because Englishness is completely intangible. Mm. It's like a, if I can use the metaphor, it's like a mantelpiece and you choose the things that you put on your mantelpiece from Englishness. Now, but you talk about mm -hmm. Shakespeare. Not everybody relates to that. My and partner it, hates Shakespeare. Yeah. Can you and believe also, it? There's a weird thing about being English as well, which is our uh, central figures in our culture don't actually belong to us anymore. You know, the Scots have complete ownership of Robbie Burns. Mm. Shakespeare belongs to everyone. I'm pleased about that. I'm great about that. It's because of our, our language, you know, our language that went around the world with empire, which we still benefit from. Mm. We benefit from the British Empire every day. I, I know I benefit of selling guitars you know, records in Australia, in the United States of America, everywhere that speaks language, I'm benefiting from what they, what the empire did, the exploitation of the empire, you know. So that's not gone away. That's not gone away. And because we've never really reconciled ourselves to that period of exploitation, it is hard for some people who, uh, you know, have, have come, uh, their cultures come to this country as part of that process to feel comfortable about being Englishness, you know, because I'm, I'm sure your parents or grandparents have probably had a British passport. At the uh, end of empire. Yeah, yeah. Well, so when my grandmother was born, she was born in 
1936 or 1937. It was as a subject of the British Empire. Yeah, yeah. Did she not get a passport in 47? And um, she got an Indian passport. I'm not sure if she got a British passport straight away. And then she came to this country in 1953, 1954. Yeah. So that was during the, you know, what we now look at as the Windrush period yeah. where people from the Commonwealth were being invited to help recruited, rebuild this being country. Recruited. Being recruited. Being recruited. Not, not, not invited, recruited. I mean, I mean oh, like, know, genuinely, begged, genuinely begged, sought yeah, out. Yeah. She, she was first, thank heavens, yeah. first brought over to work in um, a, uh, like what was effectively, I guess, a, a hospice. So it was for people yeah. who needed looking after, but who weren't yeah. going to get better. And then they discovered she was 17. Because she was 17, she came here by herself. Wow. At the age of 17. Incredible. Um, and so they were like, shit, you can't work here. So yeah. then she phoned someone that she'd uh, met on the boat. And they hired her as a receptionist. She had to learn to type. That's cool. But uh, you see that that aspect, you know that, you know your your mum's here because we were there. That you know mm. we don't deal with the reality of that story. We don't accept that story. Mm -hmm. We, you know, it's somehow that you know you're seen of, as outsiders. You know, no British Empire. We lost the Second World War. Mm. No way. We were. You know, when we talk about you know very well alone and all that. Yeah, mm. that's right. All on our own, all 500 million of us in the mm. British Empire. We're on our own. Yeah, come on, you Nazis, come over here and try and see if you can, you know, you do, you do for us, we're in Canada. You know, yeah. our people from India, you know, there's more people in the Indian army than you've got. Why in is there army. a North African front at all? Why yeah, is yeah, there exactly. an African yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that history, we kind of gloss over and try to, you know, not, not deal with it and, and ask ourselves, why we have a multicultural society. Well, that's why, you know, that's one of the legacies of, of empire. And within that, there's a, you know, the, the Martin Luther King said, uh, you know, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, but it also bends towards inclusivity. It bends mm -hmm. towards more people coming together. It bends towards a broader sense of, of justice, <clears throat> but also of identity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and at, at what point do you become a Londoner? At what point do you become a person who grew up in, you know, the greatest city in the country? I mean, because my, you know, my great grandfathers are all out in Essex. My mm. people on my on my dad's side, his dad was from Essex. His dad was from Essex. He, you know, you know. At what point do they become? Do they stop being people from Essex and become Londoners? At what point do you stop being the first people time from you tell someone for being too slow to get the card out for the Wizard <laughs> Card Reader? The first time you do that. Yeah, but the, but that process of people moving for economic reasons, for social reasons. That's the story so it's in all our st stories. You know, someone should get on, onto Ancestry.com and say, look, tell this story, Sh show movement, mm. show movement, okay? And show me someone whose family still lives where they lived in 1700. So how do you do both of these things at once of telling truths which are hard to accept? And one of those truths might be that we're here because you were there. Or a different yeah. kind of truth might be, you know, we didn't just um, abolish slavery. Yeah. We, we, we also participated in it yeah. for a really long yeah. time. We also then replaced enslaved labor with indentured labor. Yeah. Um, how do you tell hard truths and also talk about love of country? Because, I mean, if we want to talk about love, right, all love relies on some form of idealism. I, yeah. I yeah. have to idealize my partner yeah. and I have to focus yeah sometimes it's harder than others on the things which i admire about him and vice versa because mm. i'm a very annoying person to live with all love yeah. exists in a relationship with fantasy so how do you do both these things at once how do you tell those hard truths and insist on love of country okay two things firstly identity is always contested mm -hmm. always everywhere in the world so that's always going to be uh an argument mm -hmm. you know whether or not we're going to talk about slavery whether or not we're, you know national the national trust they're trying to do at the moment mm -hmm. to be honest to be accountable for what happened uh in in the building of those houses that we still benefit from that people still can come and see still like the english language mm -hmm. we're still benefiting from the the exploitation of empire on one hand you've got to deal with that on the other hand what country which country whose country mm -hmm. you know we call it england but what is it can you sum it up in one thing i don't think you can mm -hmm. i think there's so many layers you know uh, of of identity of class of gender of uh, uh, geography, it's impossible to say country. So you have to really, you have to say society. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about this society and being part of this society? Do you feel comfortable in this society? Do you feel you belong in this place, in this society? And that it's that I think that not only um, is it possible to 
uh, make a case for that sense of belonging. But it's also possible to articulate that through music. Mm. You know, and you talked about Dave articulating the sense he doesn't feel he belongs. Mm. If you look at Jamie Webster, mm -hmm. he has a song called This Place, which ostensibly is about Liverpool, but actually the chorus is uh, my city, my people, my heart, mm. you know. And when he goes out and sings that, it, it becomes your city. I mean, I looked, I looked, he's got a video of it online where it flicks through loads of places. Some of them aren't even in Britain. Mm. Flick, 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 flick. One of them is the the cliffs where I live, that I live on. I'm like, whoa, wait, wait, it's my us. <laughs> you know? And that's what he's saying. He could have said, you know, my place mm -hmm. or our place, but he said this place. So it becomes then not about Liverpool, mm -hmm. but about belonging. You know, your ends, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, to put it in those, in your Tottenham terms, if you'd like. <laughs> like if, that in helps, if that helps, <laughs> if that helps, you know. Um, and that's not an abstract. You know, that's not an See, abstract. I, that I, feeling I, is not an abstract. I really You've agree. got it tattooed on you. That's how you have such a strength, strength, strong belonging to Palmer's Green. That's what, that's where your patriotism comes from. Your patriotism is, maybe it stands for patriotic girl. It's pa oh my God. Right, get out. <laughs> get out. Like, I mean, I, I, I agree. Check, I think we call that. Check, I'll be like, I'll be like <laughs> chucking up the chessboard. I agree with you, but this is for me the difference between art and politics, right? I love the expansiveness and the flexibility of art and that it can do things that, that movements can't. I, you know, when you were talking about uh, Jamie Webster, you know, uh, my city, uh, my, my people, place, my, heart. my home. My city, my, my people, my, my heart. My city, my people, my heart. I was thinking about Kano, uh, Made in the Manor, yeah. which for me is this album, which yep. is um, such a perfect portrait of, East London, yeah, and it is about that interaction between uh, a Cockney culture and a Caribbean culture, and there are elements of you know, and there's there's always been this element of uh, like football chanting that exists in grime as well. And for me, it was that beautiful portrait, and and sometimes a kind of melancholic portrait as well. I think art can do that, but what politics demands of us is is different, right? You're trying to build a movement based on both shared values and, and challenging things. And I suppose what I'm interested in is that you've tried to do both these things at once. You've tried to make art and also participate in movements. Do you sometimes feel that politics forces you into making certain sweeping generalizations or glossing over things in a way that art doesn't, art allows you the Well, nuance? you have a choice. You can write sloganeering songs and they work, you know, in the, in the 80s, and the end of the minor strike, I wrote a song called There's Power in the Union, mm -hmm. which is all slogan mm -hmm. song. You know, and I wrote songs that are a lot more detailed uh, critique of where we were, like the home front. No one sings the home front on a picket line. I can assure you today with the strike on with the, the, the uh, rail driver, someone somewhere will be singing There's Power in the Union, which mm -hmm. is great. I'm really pleased about that. So, you know, it, it depends what you're trying to say. But what I think what music clearly can't change the world. It has no agency but it can make you believe that the world can be changed. It can send you out of the gig feeling like you're not the only person who gives a shit about this stuff. You know, when I sing Power in the Uni at the end of the show, and there's like, you know, say there's like 500 people in the gig and 200 of them sing with their mm -hmm. fists in the air. If, if you're someone who's living in a, or working or going to school in a situation where you feel isolated because of what you believe in, you see these people around you and there, there's a solidarity in song. You draw from the song some sense that you're not alone. Now, this is true of all music. You know, you might, you go and see Adele and she's singing about her divorce. You've just been through a rotten divorce and she, you've got a song that really chimes with how you feel. If she sings it and you sing it and 2,000 other people sing it, you immediately feel that whatever emotions you've invested in that are accepted. That's a solidarity in that, that comes from all music. But when it's allied to politics as well, it can, you know, you can go away thinking, okay, you know, there are other people in this town who give a shit about the things I care about. So, you know, that, that's an important role that music plays, but it doesn't have the power to change the world, but it does have the power to make you believe the world can be changed, which is a slightly different thing. It doesn't take you that final bit. You know, ultimately, I'm not the guy who's here to change the world. I mean, people say to me after the show, well, you know, keep on doing what you do, but I'm like, mate, uh, you just seen me, that's what I do. I've done it, that's my thing. You know, it's, your, it's what you do, inspired by that. It's what you take away from that, you know. And I speak from experience because I was politicised by rock, rock Against Racism. Mm -hmm. Going to Rock Against Racism, that was, um, you know, the, in 1978, the Clash were, were on, Tom Robinson, great music, that's where I went there. But what gave me the courage of my conviction was seeing 100,000 kids just like me in Victoria Park in, in Hackney and thinking, yeah, oh, this is actually, this is the issue that my generation can define themselves with, you know, against discrimination of every kind. And I didn't realise... It was discrimination of every kind until Tom Robinson sang 
seeing if you're glad to be gay. Mm. And all the guys around me started snogging each other because we'd marched in under a banner that said, gays against Nazis. We didn't realise that. And I was not 19, 20 from Barking. I'd never met an out gay man. I'm sure I've met gay men, mm. but I'd never met an out gay man. <clears throat> I was astonished by this. But then I realised, actually, it's not just about black people. Mm. The fascists are against anyone who's any way different. So it's about discrimination. And I realised at that gig that my generation were going to define ourselves in opposition to discrimination as the previous generation defined themselves in opposition to the Vietnam War. And before that, in the UK, they defined themselves in opposition to nuclear weapons. And that's the power music has, to make you feel that something's happening here and you're part of that thing. But it's down to you then to take away that experience and actually apply it in your life. You've, you've changed the words to one of your songs, Sexuality, to include transgender people. And I've realised in recent months that you've joined a very elite club of um, me, Owen Jones and Nicola Sturgeon as being constantly mentioned by like online transphobes as like the enemy. Yep. Um, could you maybe tell me a little bit about how, how your awareness of trans issues developed yeah. and what your, your sense or experience of, of the backlash has been? Well, it, it developed in two ways. Firstly, um... I read an article by Zoe Williams in The Guardian about two years ago where she was more or less saying, I'm not really focused on this. I've kind of ignored this issue, but I realise now this is really a very, very important issue, what's going on. And I read that and I thought, you know what? I've done that as well. I've really done that as well. But this was kind of during the pandemic, so it was no way for me to sort of do anything about it. And then when I came to do my tour last year, uh, 2021, I found that the... Uh, the transphobes were attacking, trying to bring down Stonewall. And I'm like, you know, these are the people, you know, from my generation, they were the people we stood alongside that during the minor strike. It was all around that period, you know, and, and defending the gay and lesbian community during Section 28 in, mm. the, in the 80s. Stonewall were absolutely crucial to that, and I recognise that. So I just wanted to start saying at my gigs, this is not a really good idea to bring down Stonewall and to alert my audience to this idea. And to get something around that, I thought, well, I'll, also, a woman said to me, and the very last dates of the American tour in Boston, after the show, a woman said to me, a young woman said to me, you know that song Sexuality about you and the gay guy going for a bit? It's not very radical, is it? These <laughs> days, old gays are like you. The issue's here. And I was like, mm, yeah, you're actually, you're right. You are right. I need to do something about that. So a mixture of those three, three things. I started singing the, the changed lyrics, which were from just because you're gay, I won't turn you away. If you stick around, I'm sure we can find some common ground too. Just because you're they, mm. I won't turn you away. If you stick around, I'm sure we can find the right pronoun. That's <laughs> all it was. I mean, it's not a huge, you know, just a kind of acceptance of trans and non-binary communities. And I started saying, you know, brothers, sisters and siblings at the gig, mm. and, you know, just try to be a bit more inclusive. And uh, yeah, I was in the van <laughs> between gigs on the tour, uh, looking at my Twitter feed and someone was kicking off about it. And I was like, well, you know, this is why I've done it. I didn't realise I was diving into this huge, uh, you know. Your experience of Twitter would never be the same again. No, it wouldn't be. So I, I had this conversation and the next morning I woke up and I had that terrible, you ever have that, that terrible sort of tingling feeling in your eyebrows, like you get when you've got a cultural bit in your eyebrows? It can only mean one thing, you're trending on Twitter. <laughs> I was trending on Twitter. I went to this, I found this cat. I was in Exeter of all places. I find this, I'm like, oh dear, oh dear. So I start going back through my mentions to try and find out how this has possibly started. And it was people shouting at me. You had absolutely no, I was trying to talk to one or two of them. They had absolutely no idea who I was or any of my music. They're Americans. And, and I was like, wow, this is, I've really come into something. And so from that experience, I started to uh, tune into one of the really interesting things about being 65 and still being political is the fact that you live in rural Dorset and you're not active constantly in politics doesn't mean that you have to be out of the loop. You can follow someone like Ash Sarkar and over her shoulder get an idea of what's going on and see, you know, yourself at Owen, um, Speak Out Sister, you know, and, and follow these people and through their interactions, Get an idea of where the arguments are. You have to choose the right people, obviously. Uh, get an idea about what's going on. So through that, through following um, uh, you know, trans activists and, and non-binary activists, I started to get, uh, you know, get my arguments together. And 
I do run into a lot of problems with them, but I often the, the problems I often run into aren't really actually to do with with transactions. They're more about to do with accountability. Mm. You know, about, about trying to hold people to account. I mean, my my uh, most recent flare up was with J.K. Rowling. Well, I was going to ask about that because J.K. Rowling accused you effectively of condoning death and rape threats, yeah. which had nothing to do with what you said. All you said is that you agreed with Graham Norton, which is that this is a conversation which should be led by trans and non-binary people. And rather than well-known authors. I did say that, which is fair enough. Which is a, you know, did, did kind of send, you know, send a message to J.K. Rowling. But you know, I was, if I was, was a, a billionaire, I would never tweet. I would never tweet if I was a billionaire. I would just, I would be happy with my solid gold AK-47 and mountains of cocaine. You would never hear from me. <laughs> You would never hear Is that from what me. luxury communism looks like? Well, I mean, I, I've realized that I kind of like have based it on like, you know, one of the Gaddafi children or yeah. something. But it does sound <laughs> good. But yeah, so yeah, I got into a bit of a, obviously she's got 13.9 uh, million followers. So when she rises up out of her lair, it's kind of, you have like stirred up. Yeah, you're like, the oh dragon. shit. Yep. Here they come. Uh, uh, but yeah, the problem the problem with it is is it very trying to have a rational argument because it clearly is a really complex problem about how about the safety of women and girls mm -hmm. and the safety of uh, uh, trans women and uh, and trans men. How do you reconcile these two things? I think they are reconcilable because the threat to them is comes from the same place, which is male violence, mm -hmm. and that's an issue that we should all be taking responsibility for particularly men, to bring mm. their sons up to respect women, to respect girls, to respect the LGBTQ community, to respect people of colour. We should be, mm. that's, that's the responsibility is on us. To but not to, to not have a, an investment in a form of masculinity which is based on violence and yeah. has maybe invested in something else. Yeah, the toxic end of masculinity and not to be afraid of the empathic end of masculinity, you know, because that that is, we do have that aspect in masculinity as well. It's not all about, you know, being muscly and being tough and rocking out, you know my my, you know my career is based on a mixture of hard political and vulnerable love songs, and that mm -hmm. that those two things are both part of me, and I can't deny one or the other. But I'm getting off subject here. What happens is they very quickly start calling you names. But obviously, they refer to you as a misogynist. I mean, misogyny. I don't think the definition is someone who disagrees with transphobes because that's you know it, being being called a misogynist by a, a transphobe is is like being called a baby killer by a, an anti-abortionist who mm. actually, you know, takes on absolutely no uh, reference to anything you might have said about the care of babies whatsoever. They're mm. just throwing things at you. And once that, you know, once people start throwing out those kind of things, uh, and it's mad because it, it even happens to women, to feminists, get called misogynists. I've I, got, seen, I get called like, a dick panderer. Which is um, And some of that dick pandering is fired at lesbians. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, trans ally lesbians yeah. are called dick panders. I'm like, it's like you're like tearing your hair out on it, and it's like it's also like I I find it really um I, I mean I I think there's one thing which I'll say which is that I think that that there's positive stories about people encountering something new and trying to learn about it and approach it in an empathetic way. And I always think about my mum because my mum maybe about 10 years ago was like, oh, I'm not sure about this like transitioning the yeah. adolescence thing. And oh, like, is this, you know, is this a, a form of eroticism rather, yeah. you know, like, and she was a bit concerned by it. But because she's never participated on social media, no, she was able to just sort of like learn about this in her own time. And because she works in child protection and she was approaching everything from a child protection angle, initially a kind of, um, you know, uh, trans hostility or trans skepticism. But then it's then led her around to trans inclusivity of going, okay, well, because I work in child protection, I have to work with trans and non-binary youth. How, how do I meet their needs? Like what's important for their safeguarding? So she was able to do this kind of like 180 in this yeah. really gentle way, which had nothing to do with any of the But isn't that so often had. the case where you, if you encounter, uh, uh, you know, uh, transgender people and non-binary people, if you're having some experience with someone or like your kid has a transgender friend at school or non-binary mm. friend at school, you suddenly realise that they're, you know, that's just a different way of, of expressing their identity, and so I don't see them as such a great threat. It's unfortunate the the GC crowd do remind me of those people, you know, those people who, you know, when they see a black person, sort of mm. just instinctively lock their car, mm. you know, that immediate negative 
think. And so many of the things they say are exactly the same things they said about gay men in the 1980s, you mm. know, with children and uh, public toilets, that whole agenda. is exactly the same stick they used to beat the gay community with. And now we're in a situation where I, I encounter GC activists, gender critical activists, as they call themselves, complaining about inclusivity. That's how mm. far we've got. They've become anti-inclusivity. And you think to yourself, you know, this is exactly where we were 30, 40 years ago with the gays and lesbians. They weren't to be included. And we, we managed to win that battle. And now, and this battle now, you're, you're, you're using that same uh, uh, tactic to, to marginalise a, a people who like gays and lesbians in the 80s already were marginalised. I think how far we've come since then. I mean, think how do, incredible do you, how far we've come with the gay and lesbian community. Do you feel a sense of disappointment or is it like a kind of like sharpened sense of disappointment because for lots of UK uh, gender critical transphobic people, they consider themselves liberals, progressives and leftists. They either read The Guardian or work at it. Is, is there it's, something particularly frustrating? Is, yeah, it is that they, they believe themselves to be left wing. And I'm like, I can't, you know, oh, also at the same time, you know, Al, you know, in, in the case of J.K. Rowling, retweeting uh, uh, stuff by people who are anti-abortionists in the United States mm. of America, and they don't seem to, you know, to, to see the, the the problem in that. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that, I think there's a. I think Where there's do you a, think that comes from? That you could start from going, I'm a feminist, and I'm a feminist who has some concerns about what trans rights mean for um, cisgender women and girls. That you can go. From that to I will work with and stand with fascists and evangelicals and diehard anti-abortion activists. What and was, men's rights activists as well, some of them are, like, who are anti-trans. How, how do you get Horseshoe from effect? there to there? Horseshoe effect? Do you believe in that? I don't think I do. No. I think maybe I believe in radicalization that no, it's a kind no, of like no, you've been no, radicalized. No, no, no. There, I think there is a, there is a logic in it. Mm. But it's it's a logic about um, it's a penis logic. Mm -hmm. Penis bad. You've got a penis, therefore you're bad. Okay. Mm. Now there's a there's a element. There's always been a thread of that in feminism. Mm. I'm not. I wouldn't say. I'm not saying man hating. I don't. You know. But I'm, but separatism. A yeah, kind of separatist a separatism. Logic. Yeah, which is understandable. Mm. You know? And and particularly among the lesbian community. Mm. And there's a lot of lesbians involved in the uh, GC mm. movement. So there could be. A connection there, but yeah, when you when you you kind of you feel strongly about this to the extent that you have to move from the Guardian to the Daily Telegraph, mm. you've got to ask yourself, you know, well, which gonna, side am I, I on? I, I was going to say this, which is, um, of course, of course, there's there's you know the LGB Alliance, who for the most part are you know lesbian and gay and bisexual individuals who uh, reject trans people, but for the most part, I mean, these are straight people i mean that's the thing is that like you know most most lesbians and most gay men are trans inclusive yeah um it's a weird phenomenon of heterosexuals kind of saying oh are you going to demand lesbians sleep with transgender women yeah. i was like yeah, and yeah. i was like but you're neither of the people yeah, yeah. in that bedroom yeah. why yeah. why do you care well there is an argument that you know you're white why do you care as well the other way around on racism i think you, I can't, you don't think you can fence it off in that way but there is a an aspect of it but i think it's, it's more like appropriate it's, it'd be like if a, a white person was having a go at a gay person citing me their muslim friend i'd be yeah, like yeah, yeah. i'd be like don't oh, yeah, in this so conversation. You mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're using someone else to justify beating. Yeah. It's a punching down thing. That's my problem with it. I don't recognise a feminism that punches down. All the feminism, all the feminists I've ever worked with, up to and including my partner, who's mm -hmm. livid about the anti-trans stuff. She, she gets more angry about it than I do because she says, while we're wasting our time on this, the, you know, male violence is getting worse and worse. This is, you know, march towards mm -hmm. the sound. She's not saying in these terms, but she's like, March towards the sound of the guns. This is not mm. where the fight is, for heaven's sake. We're letting them, you know, we're letting male violence. And that's the pitch I make to my audience because there is an element in my audience. Let's call them geezers my age. Mm. For who this is a bit complicated mm. because, you know, in their head, they're, they're still radical because they, you know, they bought Billy Bragg albums in the 80s <laughs> and they, they bought the, they went to the clash and they probably were out in the minor strike. Mm -hmm. So they probably were, might, you know, undoubtedly support the Green and Common Women. And you see feminism as part of that. Mm -hmm. their their radical background. Now suddenly 
people who they thought of radical feminists, Judy Bindle, people like that, mm. you know, who for, formerly you stood beside, are now seem to be in another place. And it's like, you know what, I'm going to sit on this fence until my ass freezes. So I'm saying at gigs, like, <laughs> my pitch to them, you know, someone was asking me about the other day, you know, how do you inspire young people to become political? <laughs> It's not my I'm 65. <laughs> my job is to make those, those formerly radical people who are now cosy. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a song, I have a song on the most recent album called Mid Century Modern, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of about this. It's, you know, um, you know, it's hard to get your bearings in a world that doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And positions I took long ago feel comfy as an old armchair, but the kids that tear the statues down, they challenge me to see the gap between the man I am and the man I want to be. Because it's so easy to think you've done all your radical stuff and you're, oh yeah, I've, you know, here I am, I don't like this, this is how we do it nowadays. Well, actually, you know, uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, I think, uh, it's a generalization, but I think generally young people are more interested in accountability than freedom of speech. Mm. They would rather uh, people be held to account rather than allow people to, to you know, say whatever they want to say. Whereas the older generation, believe that freedom of speech solves all problems. I don't believe that. I mean, mm. there's that, it annoys the shit out of me every time <laughs> I walk past it, that Orwell quote outside the BBC. Oh, yeah. You know, um, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. You know what? People don't want to hear that the Sandy Hook victims were actors. You know what I'm saying? Mm. They don't want to hear the Holocaust never happened. Mm. That's, that's not about liberty. That's about license. Mm. I mean, Orwell did go on to say, you know, unless it, unless it, damages the community, but they didn't put it up on the wall. That's justification for, you know, every right wing arsehole, mm. every misinformation program. That that's the wrong definition of, of liberty. Liberty without accountability and, and and equality is not freedom. You know, it's 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 Donald Trump's Twitter feed. You know, mm. if you don't have if it's not leavened with accountability, if it's not there aren't consequences. You can say whatever you like. Say whatever mm. you like, but you can never do that without there being any consequences. And so much of this cancel culture bullshit is people reacting to the consequences with their own foolish uh, behaviour. Does this put you at odds sometimes with um, artists or political activists or journalists like of your own generation when you're like, I'm not scared of this cancel culture. It seems to me to be a way of working out this relationship yeah. between freedom of speech and accountability. Does it put you at odds with people? Well, I say I got into trouble with J.K. Rowling. That was <laughs> ostensibly about cancel culture because the other part of the tweet was having a go at John Cleese mm. for going on and on about cancel culture from the top of the British media triangle. <laughs> you know, that's the other side of it, isn't it? It's, it's kind of mad. And whenever you talk about this, I mean, is this maybe an outgrowth of celebrity? Because one of one of the things that I often find is that, like, I um, talk to people who've got who have platforms and they're well known. They've got profile. It's their job to um, talk publicly in some way or another, and they have this tremendous sense of their own persecution. And I understand it because when you have a job and you're talking to people, you get a lot of stuff coming back. But it can be really misleading you go and it is me the <laughs> victim of reality and it's like but it's well you know when you're being oh. when you're being confronted by uh people who uh you've offended who you particularly you're punching down mm. then the the temptation to make yourself into the victim is almost uh, uh irresistible isn't it that is kind of you know poor pitiful me you know, I'm just getting told off all the time. Well, yeah, because you've said these stupid things. I mean, often in this conversation, it then moves on very quickly, the cancel culture, people who believe in cancel culture, to people who have lost their job because of something they said. Mm. And nobody should lose their job because of what they said. But if I had a, a roadie who came on stage in a midnight gig and made a racist statement on mic to my audience, mm. I wouldn't want to work with him anymore. Mm. So there is an element there. But what's missed in that conversation is, and what I would argue, is more of an example of a culture that cancels people. Is, for instance, the report last week about the fire brigade uh, being inherently racist, and the experience of people who had forced to leave the brigade because they, you know, they couldn't put up with the racist or the sexist behaviour, homophobic behaviour. Those people have been cancelled. Genuinely, they have lost their jobs because there wasn't enough respect for them, enough inclusivity within that job, within that service. That's what cancel culture is. It's much more that than than someone who says something about uh, uh, something negative about the trans community loses their job and then becomes, you know, one of the friends of J.K. Rowling and is on Twitter every day, you know, with you know, hundred thousand followers. But I mean, part of this comes back to the progressive versus um, traditional patriotism discussion because it seems to me a lot of the examples that you've been citing, like the National Trust, which because it has been in this uh, arena of contestation, is now looking at 
the role of slavery in UK stately homes. You're seeing that happen a lot in museums and universities as well. The backlash to that is that like, not only is this unpatriotic, it's itself a form of cancel culture, right? That expanding the conversation in this way is, is an attack on freedom of speech rather than expansion of it. So, I mean, do you view it as that, well, you, you brand it as patriotism because it makes it more palatable or, or is there maybe a bit of a limitation here of going, you can't, you can't try and play with the patriotism sword because, you know, the Daily Mail has a bigger one. Daily Mail will always have a, a bigger sword on those kind of issues. You're never going to, you know, it's like, you know, Starmer should realise he's never going to be able to outflag the Tories. They're mm -hmm. always going to have more Union Jacks than he's got. That's their brand, mm -hmm. you know. So he's wasting his time trying to, you know, cram Union Jacks in behind him when he's, when he's talking to people. Instead, Until like you just see his eyes, yeah, like right, yeah. and they fill yeah, up yeah, the yeah, frame. That's right. Yeah, he's got a suit, a Union Jack like Pete Townsend, <laughs> Union Jack suit. It's you know, it it's ridiculous. It's it's you know, Labour Party has always been a cause or nothing else, and it's and that has to be true again now because so many people need someone to come along and take up that cause, the cause of you know, all of us having to work in an economy where there's just not enough accountability. Because you know, when I talk about accountability, it's not just about holding people to account on Twitter. You know, socialism is fundamentally about accountability. It was based on, you know, labor unions trying to hold the bosses to account in the workplace. It all comes out of that, that idea of accountability. So within patriotism, because the traditional view of patriotism is immutable, because it's like a statue and can't be changed and can't be daubed and can't be reinterpreted, we're always going to be uh, at odds with that. But because our... You know, we're the people in Trafalgar Square, we're not the statues. And that changes all the time, the identity of those people, the why they're there, what they're doing. Sometimes there's nobody there. Sometimes it's just empty. Sometimes it's just pigeons. And that's the same with, with Englishness. Sometimes it's just the emptiness of it. It doesn't, you know, to try and sum it all up, what, what particular moment are you going to pick on? And you'll always be able to find, I mean, this isn't just an English thing. I mean, this is about any, mm -hmm. any society. You're always going to be able to find things that are contrary. So in the end, it's it's who oh, it's back to all, isn't it? Who yeah. controls the past? Who controls the present? Controls the past? And who controls the past? Controls the future? It is a little bit like that, you know. Whose idea of whose narrative is the dominant narrative? And I think we found around when the Queen died that whose whose narrative was the dominant narrative, and we all had to kind of come to. Terms Were you surprised with that. by how top down the morning was? The yeah, well, not really. No, it was it was bound to be a bit like that. I was surprised how um, enforced it was. Uh, I found that a bit, uh, I mean, I, I rocked up the night she died. I was on my way back from Germany and, and a day after and rocked up at Winchester Services to find it was like all these big pictures of the Queen and there was a film, they were playing a film inside. I was like, whoa, this is a bit, a bit over the top. I've just come it's in kind for of dystopian. coffee and a sandwich. Well, not quite dystopian, but a bit like, you know. I think there is a dystopian when all the screens are showing the same thing. Yeah. In any movie. Yeah, that's true. That's bad. That's true. Right. But that, it could be the World Cup final though. I don't know. It's not it's always I, bad. But, you know, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But I, I, I did feel, I did feel an emotional Heft. I, it's a shame I wasn't at home when the news came through because I think me and my partner would have had a, a, an emotional moment. Not so much because of the Queen, mm -hmm. but because of who she represents. She was born in the 1920s like our parents. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of like the last symbol of that generation, mm -hmm. you know, that was still vital in our culture. So her passing is a bit like saying, well, that's it. That lot are gone now. They're gone. The people who lived through the war, you know, the people mm -hmm. who built the welfare state. You know, when I was a kid, there used to be Victorians around. You know, I had an, I had an auntie who lived around the corner for us who was in her 80s, and she lived in an upstairs flat with gaslight. This is in the 70s. A gaslight? Gaslights and, a, and a, a kitchen range in her living room that she cooked on, right? This was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So she was, you know, she was born in 1880-something, Aunt Anna. And so those people were all gone, and I kind of miss those people. I used mm -hmm. to run errands for a guy who was in the gas in the First World War. He had some incredible stories. And when the when the... The the um in the summer when the pressure was on, he used to, he used to, his cough used to get really wet. I mean, he was in, he was like a walking museum. His house was incredible. Mm. People and those people are gone. It's like the the first generation, like your grandmother's, mm. you know, uh, people. That generation when they go, there's an experience with them that's gone forever. And the Queen, I you're suppose, never going to see 
the sofas with the plastic kept on no, on them no. ever again. No, That's going to go, go with that go. generation and of my, And my, you know, my Irish friends over the road, what was different about uh, our house to their house was there was always a picture of a, a bloody Jesus on the wall, <laughs> you know, looking sad and a crown of thorns. And that, that's all gone. Oh, and so to be that, fair, my Irish best friend still has that. Oh, do they? And she also yeah, has but it's um, kitsch, though, isn't it? Isn't it? No, she's doing well, it out of okay, kitsch. The thing is, is it's, that like it's, a, it's like it becomes like the, uh, the sort of like the green lady. Yeah, but it's both. It's oh, okay. both. It's one of those things where, like, I kind of could never work out how much she was joking about yeah. this stuff until uh, her and an ex boyfriend actually had a massive row about keeping up a clock that she had with the glow in the dark Virgin Mary inside it. Because oh, okay. he thought it was kitsch. But she. And it was kind of, but she yeah. was also like. But she's staying. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, so the Queen dying, I, that's that's what it hit me with. Was like that they're gone now. They're all gone. And I mean, and and the implication of that, of course, is now we are that generation now. We're mm. the generation who, who everyone in twenty years' time, they're going to be like, oh, you know, he used to live next door to this the guy, guy saw called the clash. Billy, and he, he saw he, the clash. He knew how to work a fax machine. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, I know how to work a fax machine. I was also a rank Xerox key operator when I was a bank oh, messenger. What? Yeah, yeah, I had to, I had to fix a, a a huge when a a, um, a photocopy machine was as big as your car. I used to know how to fix them. But uh, that was a long time ago. That was a, more like a printing press than a than a fax machine. I mean, th this is actually, you know, w one of the things I always think when I listen to a New England is that it's a melancholic song. It is a sad, it is a sad song, it and is. it is. You, you talked about the feeling of England being the emptiness, and that's the thing that I always thought when when I heard it. Is that is part of this a kind of tension between this like wanting to kind of leap into a shared future and not quite being able to so you, there's the sadness that comes from like you know this england the thing that we share is actually always dying and the thing that we want to share we're, we're never getting our hands on well the thing is the 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 british empire was never cleared away in the way that you know other nations you know napoleon's empire was cleared away Hitler's empire was cleared away ours kind of like you know the people who uh, took it back, but they never came to London and tore down the, the institutions that built it. Mm. So consequently, it's kind of still there, like a, the words in a stick of rock, however far we go. And I think until we come to terms with that, um, I think there will, people will always feel a bit um, difficult about English. But I think, I think there is a, one of the interesting things about being British is everybody's allowed two flags. Mm -hmm. You've got the Union Jack and then the flag of your birth country. Now, in my case, that's the English flag. But in my partner's case, she was born in Trinidad. Her dad was mm -hmm. a doctor working for Shell. Um, and so she that's her other flag that she's allowed to fly. And, and that duality gives space to create something uh, new outside of the British Empire. So the Scots, in many ways, over the last 40 years, have kind of like passed the baby of the British Empire to the English and said, you know, actually, there's nothing to do with us. We're different. We didn't do all that shit, you know. Despite if you go to Glasgow and Edinburgh, there's loads of imperial monuments, but they've kind of like, you know. Or like, why were there so many black people in the Caribbean whose names start with Max something? Exactly, but psychologically, they've stepped away from mm. that. So there is, a, there is a possibility to be, I hate to say it, a New England. Uh, but um, I'm not, you know, suggesting anything to do with the song, but a different sensibility around Englishness that is that gives us a space to step into if we are going to come to terms with what the empire was. Where do we go from there? Will we go to this England that is now the most multicultural society in Europe? That's what England is now. If you want to step away from what England, Britain was, that's that's the place we should go but is to. That, uh, this was something I wanted to ask you because you know you're you're in you were in favour of Scottish independence as I understand it, Welsh independence as well. I imagine if Irish reunification was on the table, you wouldn't say no. Self determination. Are you interested in bringing a a, a different, a multicultural England to life by destroying Britain, right? The framework of, of yeah. Britain. Well, I think I think Britain changes every century, doesn't it? You know, the definition of what constitutes Britain has changed. It changed in the 20th century when the Republic of Ireland left. Uh, it was uh, added to in the 19th century of Ireland, in the 17th century of Scotland. So it's all, it's you know, it's not uh, an immutable thing. So it could again change. And I think we'll all realise about that. I think it needs to be able to, how do you, you manifest England? You know, it's kind of weird. Mm. In, the the The... 
lack of England in our national uh, culture. I know it sounds strange to say that, but if you go to Edinburgh, there's a really good museum of Scotland. And in Cardiff, there's a really good museum of Wales. But there's no museum of England. Uh, if you want to find out the origin story of the English, you have to go to the British Museum. And it's in between the Romans and the Byzantine Empire. There's a couple of rooms with the Anglo-Saxons and a bit of, you know, the Sutton Hoo mask and some stuff there. there. It's pretty good, but it's just mm -hmm. one room. Now, if you're asking people to assimilate who have come from another country, where do you give them an idea of what society, how it developed, what it looks like? You know, if you're a Scottish immigrant, you can go to the Museum of Scotland and you can see in there the story of post-war migration into Scotland you know, from Europe, from elsewhere as well. And so they, they, it gives you something to at least have an idea about what it is. There's nowhere that manifests that in England. There's no Museum of England. There's no uh, um, situation where you can see England as it is reflected, except in our sporting teams. So if you look at the national team, whether it's soccer, men's, women's, you know, all the way down to the national bowls team, you can see reflected what our society actually looks like. And it doesn't look like the shit in the British Museum. I'm telling I mean, you that for nothing. But, but is this, I mean, I totally agree with you on, on the on the sporting thing. And I think you also see that with France. You see modern France yeah. in the in the yeah. French team as, as as much as I want uh, Kylian Mbappe to have a career ruining injury. Like you do see a modern France in that team. Um, but is the issue for, for England that it's like the little old man behind the huge screen in The Wizard of Oz, right? What we had was Britain. What we had was a Britain which was made of, you know, English dominance over, you know, the the other home nations. We had the British Empire as well, which was the outgrowth from, from that. And now you're sort of saying, well, what is England? It's the little man behind the screen going, no, I'm still the really big dad. I'm still the big but guy. It's not. The big it's green not. Guy. It's not. It's, England is the Beatles. England is Shakespeare. England is Bobby Moore. England is all the, you know, the world beating stuff that we've sent out there from England. It's just that we we cloak ourselves in the Union Jack because it's perceived to be a more um iconic, powerful culture. You know, it's the it's the the Empire. We still have that Empire imperial mentality. And that's what we need to 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 that's why we need to kind of find that space called England that we all feel comfortable in because it's here. It's just that we don't recognise it in that way. You know, it's not it's my mate Paul, you know, not feeling English, not feeling that he was made welcome. And that's why it's important that you try to evoke ideas like uh, progressive patriotism, to make it accessible, not to demand people accept it, not to say this is where you've got to be, but to say this is open. This is who we are. This is what we feel defines our society. You know, do you feel in any way part of this? If not, that's fair enough. Now, maybe we need to repoint it a bit better to make it more accessible. But it, there is a space that we share, that we live in, that we're part of, that's called England. Do you feel part of it? If you do, then you're English. That's just good enough for me. Well, that seems to me to be a really good place to finish up. A uh, lingering question of, do you feel English? That's good enough for Billy Bragg. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have Thanks a final me. question. Okay, go on. Is the glass half full or half empty? Um, so the main problem is that it's full of urine, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> now you're taking a piss. <laughs>